Emmanuel believes that the art student ring, the Israeli intelligence gathering art student ring, was not associated with 9-11 or tracking um, the 9-11 hijackers, but was designed to monitor or control the MDMA trade uh, because Emmanuel believes the DEA and the feds, I, I don't know if he means the FBI, he didn't specify, were setting up MDMA dealers in every major city across the United States. So it kind of makes sense, but it also still really doesn't make sense because what were these Israeli art students hoping to gain? I mean, you would think that if they were really doing intelligence gathering operations about the MDMA trade, they would do it mostly like at the street level. It's odd that they would be basically trying to penetrate DEA facilities and the private residences of DEA employees. That just seems very unusual. If the goal was to learn more about the ecstasy trade, learn more about the DEA's uh, counter efforts to try to combat or control the ecstasy trade, why would they go about it that way? That's the one thing that really doesn't make sense. So I know that we're already an hour into this podcast, and I'm basically setting up the premise of this entire podcast as there is some kind of nexus point here between MDMA these Israeli art students in the Mossad, well, that's, I think that that's true. But why? Why is the question. We don't know. That's the strange part. Now, there is a lot of other information, though, about uh, Israel's involvement with the ecstasy trade um, that I'm going to cover. And also, uh, some of these other Israeli art students and other Israeli cutout organizations and Israeli private companies like Amdocs, they cross over into this sort of DEA monitoring operation, supposed you know drug trade operation, gathering intelligence on it, to an operation that appeared to be tracking some of the you know so-called Islamic extremists that were in the United States, wanted terrorists on watch lists. This even includes the four men who were caught and the police were called on them for allegedly celebrating and filming the 9-11 attacks um, from urban moving systems, which is, according to a lot of researchers, is some kind of other Israeli cutout operation. Amdocs is not a cutout operation. It's a legitimate company that has tons of business all across the United States. But what Carl Cameron alleges based on government documents is that Amdocs was essentially able to look at all the phone records of every, every, you know, telecommunication company in the United States and was able to tell when the DEA and other federal agencies were wiretapping suspects. They had some kind of indicator that they could see it from their perspective. They could see this information. Now the theory is that Amdocs is not just an Israeli company loyal to the Israeli government, it's that it's an actual conduit to the Mossad and possibly even Israeli organized crime. And that's an interesting thing because it appears that, at least when involving some of these ecstasy and other things involving Amdocs, it was a crossover between the Israeli government and some kind of Israeli organized crime. In 1997... The U.S. government believed Israeli organized crime compromised secret wiretaps, federal government surveillance activity, and also that Israeli organized criminals somehow got information about the feds through phone records and gave personal phone records and data to Israeli drug dealers. Essentially, I mean, this third part's really interesting. So not only did they compromise wiretap, secret wiretaps, but they also used phone records to identify federal agents who were investigating them and were able to track them to be one step ahead of them. This got written up about in an internal memo from 1997. The later was reported on by various journalists. 
But apparently this was the first major incident where federal agencies, including the DEA, FBI, um, Secret Service, believed that there was some kind of backdoor in the systems that they were using to conduct investigations, a conduit, a backdoor to Israeli organized crime. In this memo, um, they do mention some crossover between Israeli organized crime and Israeli intelligence. And the reason that this issue comes up um, is not necessarily because of ecstasy, but it's because the DEA and these other federal agencies allege that private companies that they use that are Israeli based, like Amdocs, like Converse Infosys, um, and these different companies were actually feeding information to Israeli organized crime. And the, you know, the fact is that these companies are funded um, 50% by the Israeli government. But what kind of drug bust was it exactly? Was it ecstasy? Um, that's actually unclear. But it appears that, you know, if we connect all these data points together, I would guess that this was some kind of major ecstasy bust that was blown. Um, that involved the FBI, DEA, LAPD, and Secret Service. And essentially what this all means is that the U.S. government, or aspects of it, different agencies, believed that Israeli intelligence essentially had a backdoor to our in electronic intelligence for years via several private Israeli companies, one of them being a company called Amdocs. So I'm going to play you a little clip from Carl Cameron's report on exactly what Amdocs was and how it fits into all this. Fox News has learned that some American terrorism investigators fear certain suspects in the September 11th attacks may have managed to stay ahead of them by knowing who and when investigators are calling on the telephone. How? By obtaining and analyzing data that's generated every time someone in the U.S. makes a phone call. What's sitting in say, please? Here's how the system works. Most directory assistance calls and virtually all call records and billing in the U.S. are done for the phone companies by Amdocs Limited, an Israeli-based private telecommunications company. Amdocs has contracts with the 25 biggest phone companies in America and more worldwide. The White House and other secure government phone lines are protected, but it is virtually impossible to make a call on normal phones without generating an Amdocs record of it. In recent years, the FBI and other government agencies have investigated Amdocs more than once. The firm has repeatedly and adamantly denied any security breaches or wrongdoing. But sources tell Fox News that in 1999, the super-secret National Security Agency, headquartered in Northern Maryland, issued what's called a top-secret, sensitive, compartmentalized information report, TSSCI, warning that records of calls in the United States were getting into foreign hands in Israel in particular. Investigators do not believe calls are being listened to, but the data about who's calling whom and when is plenty valuable in itself. An internal Amdocs memo to senior company executives suggests just how Amdocs generated call records could be used, quote, widespread data mining techniques and algorithms, combining both the properties of the customer, like credit rating, and properties of the specific behavior, specific behavior such as whom the customers are calling. The Amdocs memo says the system should be used to prevent phone fraud, but U.S. counterintelligence analysts say it could also be used to spy through the phone system. Fox News has learned that the NSA has held numerous classified conferences to warn the FBI and CIA how Amdocs records could be used. At one NSA briefing, a diagram by the Argonne National Lab was used to show that if the phone records are not secure, major security breaches are possible. Another briefing document said, quote, it has become increasingly apparent that systems and networks are vulnerable. Such crimes always involve unauthorized persons or persons who exceed their authorization, acting on exploitable vulnerabilities. Those vulnerabilities are growing because according to another briefing, the U.S. relies too much on foreign companies like Amdocs for high-tech equipment and software. Quote, many factors have led to increased dependence on code developed overseas. We buy rather than train or develop solutions. 
U.S. intelligence does not believe the Israeli government is involved in a misuse of Amdocs information, and Amdocs insists that its data is secure. What U.S. government officials are worried about, however, is the possibility that Amdocs data could get into the wrong hands, particularly organized crime, and that would not be the first time that such a thing has happened. Fox News has documents of a 1997 drug trafficking case in Los Angeles in which telephone information, the types that Amdocs collects, was used to, quote, completely compromise the communications of the FBI, the Secret Service, the DEA, and the LAPD. And we'll have that and a lot more in the days ahead, Brett. Los Angeles, 1997. A major local, state, and federal drug investigation sours. The suspects? Israeli organized crime with operations in New York, Miami, Las Vegas, Canada, Israel, and Egypt. The allegations? Cocaine and ecstasy trafficking and sophisticated white-collar credit card and computer fraud. The problem? According to classified law enforcement documents obtained by Fox News, the bad guys had the cops' beepers, cell phones, even home phones under surveillance. Some who did get caught admitted to having hundreds of numbers and using them to avoid arrest. Quote, this compromised law enforcement communications between LAPD detectives and other assigned law enforcement officers working various aspects of the case. The organization discovered communications between organized crime intelligence division detectives, the FBI, and the Secret Service. Shock spread from the DEA to the FBI in Washington and then the CIA. An investigation of the problem, according to law enforcement documents, concluded, quote, the organization has apparent extensive access to database systems to identify pertinent personal and biographical information. When investigators tried to find out where the information might have come from, they looked at Amdocs, a publicly traded firm based in Israel. Amdocs generates billing data for virtually every call in America, and they do credit checks. The company denies any leaks, but investigators still fear that the firm's data is getting into the wrong hands. Now, to me, the, some of the most noteworthy parts of the report are, number one, the fact that there's some crossover, seeming crossover between organized crime and Israeli intelligence, or meaning that it's possible, I guess, best case scenario is that Amdocs had a relationship or leaks going to Israeli organized crime and separately to Israeli intelligence. But I think, you know, Obviously, this is Media Roots Radio. We're not going to beat around the bush about something like this. I mean, it's pretty obvious that the CIA was balls fucking deep with the U.S. mafia uh, for a long time and probably still is to some degree. So to think that um, the Mossad has no connections to Israeli organized crime whatsoever, kind of be naive, I think. So I'm just going to operate on that premise, and I hope people listening are okay with that and don't think I'm, you know, leaping too far with that assertion here. But the other two things that jump out to me in the report is that federal investigators believe that some of these leaks coming from Amdocs were compromising their terrorism investigations leading up to 9-11. Now, it's not specified in this Carl Cameron report specifically, but there is evidence to suggest that some of these Israeli art students who lived in Florida were living right next to some of the 9-11 hijackers. So they don't specifically go into that in this Fox News report, but that's noteworthy as well. Another noteworthy thing is that Amdocs, the federal government in 1997, believed that Amdocs had blown a major drug bust operation that involved multiple federal agencies. So we have two types of incidents that Amdocs helped blow for U.S intelligence gathering efforts or federal investigators. And those two incidents, genres of incidents, I guess, involve blowing a drug bust and blowing, you know, potential terrorist surveillance operation. What the hell do those have to do with each other? Is the, to, That's the question that keeps coming up for me during all this research, is what does one have to do with the other? Why would so many, the majority of these Israeli art students, be doing things involving drug enforcement, the DEA? Why would they be going to Dance Safe? Why would they be visiting the homes of journalists who live in Maryland? I mean, you heard that clip at the beginning. That was actually from a uh, like a Washington Post journalist, I believe, who said he got visited by the art students. I have a friend, um, friend of many years, 
uh, he's an architect. He works at an architectural firm in the Bay Area. In the late 90s, uh, he doesn't remember if it was 98 or 99, he's not sure, but he also remembers being visited by two Israeli art students who were so aggressive when they came to the reception desk that they just barge into the office. He works, you know, in the, in the office, and he remembers them walking into the office, like past the reception desk, which is a weird enough thing to happen in general at like a private office inside of a building. And so he was just like, what the hell is this? And he read later, just like Emmanuel did about Israeli art students, and he connected it back to that experience that he had. So I've just played for you evidence that they visited a dance safe office, an unlisted address in, in Oakland, not San Francisco. I was actually wrong about that earlier. And a private architectural firm in the Bay Area. So, you know, one of those has to do with ecstasy. I guess maybe, you know, the other one, what does that have to do with? But even visiting a journalist, I guess, is also strange to me. Why would these Israeli art students be visiting a journalist? Was that journalist working on some kind of story about Israel? He didn't mention anything about that. He just thought it was odd, he said. Um, he didn't say why he thought they were actually there. But in Carl Cameron's report, he mentions the specifics of how before 9-11, 120 of these supposed art students or Israeli spies posing as other occupations were rounded up. After 9-11, 60 more were rounded up. Now, we don't know if these were all self proclaimed Israeli art students or not, but it seems that the overwhelming majority of them are based off of like the DEA memo and what we can actually get our hands on from the federal government. But what Carl Cameron does say in the report that's interesting that the DEA doesn't mention and that you can't find on actually in print on other leaked documents is that a half dozen, I guess six, I don't know why he doesn't just say six, he says a half dozen of the Israeli art students actually were Amdocs employees. So that's uh, that's really interesting that they didn't even hide their employment. It was like instantly available information that these people work for Amdocs. So of course that's going to inc increase the suspicion of whatever federal government employees or agencies were already looking at this. They're going to be like, oh shit, some of these Israeli art students also work for Amdocs, this company that we thought was blowing all these operations of ours for years. To me, it's just very, very interesting. Um, and this company is, still exists. And for a company like this to go through a exposure like this, especially by the U.S. government, it is f absolutely fascinating that that Israeli company is still active, still s seems fine, and it never got put through this the ringer or the smear machine in any form except for this Fox News report by Carl Cameron. Now imagine if a Chinese or especially a Russian company was caught or exposed doing a huge amount of the phone record data collection in the United States and it was actually in some kind of intelligence front the whole time. Would that company even survive? No, that company would be absolutely ruined and smeared and turned into a national news story for a while it would be associated in people's minds with foreign spying this this is not this company still has a great reputation seriously look it up online i'm not kidding i mean when you look it up you'll of course find some of the stuff that i've been going through but the majority of the stuff online when you pull up amdocs is positive it's clean it seems clean that's an indication that there was a huge cover up here now let's go into the fact that Israel in general seems to be dominating or was dominating as late as 2003 the, the worldwide MDMA trade. If you thought this was just going to be about one Israeli company um, that gets subsidized by the Israeli government that was blowing intelligence operations by the U.S. government, you would be wrong. There's actually another company that a lot of federal agencies and federal agents believed were sort of working hand in glove with Amdocs to blow these operations for, they say, Israeli organized crime. Now, but this company that I'm about to tell you about, Converse Infosys, uh, is subsidized at the tune of 50% of their budget by the Israeli government. And yet this company has just a wide open backdoor for Israeli organized crime. Again, 
it's kind of an odd thing, and it also implies that the Israeli government does sometimes work with Israeli organized crime. Perhaps there is some crossover there with the ecstasy trade. Let me play the rest of this clip from Carl Cameron's report. When investigators checked their own wiretapping system for leaks, they grew concerned about potential vulnerabilities in the computers that intercept, record, and store the wiretapped calls. A main contractor is Converse Infosys, which works closely with the Israeli government and under a special grant program is reimbursed for up to 50% of its research and development costs by Israel's Ministry of Industry and Trade. The company is Converse Infosys, a subsidiary of an Israeli-run private telecommunications firm with offices throughout the U.S. It provides wiretapping equipment for law enforcement. Here's how wiretapping works in the U.S. Every time you make a call, it passes through the nation's elaborate network of switchers and routers run by the phone companies. Custom computers and software made by companies like Converse are tied into that network to intercept, record, and store the wiretapped calls and at the same time transmit them to investigators. The manufacturers have continuing access to the computers so they can service them and keep them free of glitches. This process was authorized by the 1994 Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA. Senior government officials have now told Fox News that while CALEA made wiretapping easier, it has led to a system that is seriously vulnerable to compromise and may have undermined the whole wiretapping system. Indeed, Fox News has learned that Attorney General John Ashcroft and FBI Director Robert Mueller were both warned October 18th in a hand-delivered letter from 15 local, state, and federal law enforcement officials who complained that, quote, law enforcement's current electronic surveillance capabilities are less effective today than they were at the time Kalia was enacted. Converse insists the equipment it installs is secure, but the complaint about this system is that the wiretap computer programs made by Converse have in effect a back door through which wiretaps themselves can be intercepted by unauthorized parties. Adding to the suspicions is the fact that in Israel, Converse works closely with the Israeli government and under special programs gets reimbursed for up to 50% of its research and development costs by the Israeli Ministry of Industry and Trade. But investigators within the DEA, INS, and FBI have all told Fox News that to pursue or even suggest Israeli spying through Converse is considered career suicide. And sources say that while various FBI inquiries into Converse have been conducted over the years, they've been halted before the actual equipment has ever been thoroughly tested for leaks. A 1999 FCC document indicates several government agencies expressed deep concerns that too many unauthorized, non-law enforcement personnel can access the wiretap system. And the FBI's own nondescript office in Chantilly, Virginia, that actually oversees the Kalia wiretapping program, is among the most agitated about the threat. But there is a bitter turf war internally at FBI. It is the FBI's office in Quantico, Virginia, that has jurisdiction over awarding contracts and buying intercept equipment. And for years, they've thrown much of the business to Converse. A handful of former U.S. law enforcement officials involved in awarding Converse government contracts over the years now work for the company. I mean, that last part he just said is incredibly fucking crazy. I mean, what government officials that work for the U.S. government now work for Converse Infosys after this scandal happened. That's really interesting. Love to know who those people are. Carl Cameron doesn't actually mention their names, oddly. Did they have dual citizenship to Israel? Um, were they like some of these neocons in the administration who had dual citizenship? Or were they just happen to be like American-born citizens who were taken in by this company? It's a strange thing. But Carl Cameron also mentioned a few other interesting points there. One of them is that Robert Mueller was actually handed a letter warning him about this breach. Robert Mueller was just assigned to be FBI director, I would say maybe a few months before 9-11. I don't know the exact time. He was brand new. And yet this is the guy who was hired to investigate Russian Trump campaign collusion and came up with nothing. And here he's being handed a warning from several federal agencies and agents signing a letter to him, warning him about this, and he doesn't say anything publicly about it at all. He essentially buried it. And he knew, you know, that people in the FBI were warning and blowing, you know, blowing the whistle on this, but he didn't care. Um, just like the anthrax attacks, just like WMDs that he lied about, just like Saudi involvement in 9-11, uh, Robert Mueller covered all this up. And he's also here covering up 
Israeli involvement in blowing our intelligence operations. So once again, this just really goes to show how absurd Russiagate and the anti-Russian hysteria is when we have this real, fully documented, fully verifiable, actual real case involving up to 200 Israeli spies operating on American soil, and yet the story is completely vanished from the mainstream media. And frankly, what it's turned into now, and this shouldn't really be a surprise to anyone who's followed you know, the 9-11 truth world or anything like that, what it's turned into now essentially is that all of this leads to Israel somehow is behind 9-11, and that's who really did 9-11. I haven't personally seen evidence that's convinced me in that direction at all. There are some interesting connections here, however, though, with 9-11, and Carl Cameron is actually talking about some of those. But what's essentially happened is there was a campaign launched, and I think even organizations like the ADL and SPLC even got behind this, saying that basically bringing up this Israeli art student story or these urban moving systems story about the four Israelis um, basically arrested on 9-11 for allegedly celebrating the attacks was essentially an anti-Semitic story. So that's how they addressed it, and that's and people were essentially smeared for talking about it for that reason. But that doesn't mean that it's not true that neo-Nazis – and you know, people like that did run with the story too and try to add to it their own narrative. Here's actually a clip of, uh, of Colin Powell being asked about it by a reporter, just to give you an example of how mainstream and still acceptable the story was for a short amount of time until it basically became a completely untouchable third rail issue. Asked this week about another sprawling investigation and the detention of 60 Israelis since September 11th, the Bush administration treated the questions like hot potatoes. I would just refer you to Department of Justice with it. I'm not familiar with the report. I'm aware that uh, some Israeli citizens have been detained. With respect to why they are being retain detained and the other aspects of, of your question, whether it's because they are in intelligence services or what they were doing, I will uh, defer to the Department of Justice and the FBI to answer that. So I wanted to switch gears back to this idea that the Israeli government, the Mossad, Israeli organized crime has some kind of involvement with the global ecstasy trade. And I promise you, though, uh, by the end of this broadcast, I will play you some more clips and delve more into um, how these Israeli art students were actually living next door to some of the 9-11 hijackers and were most concentrated in Hollywood, Florida, which is where actually 14 of the 19 hijackers resided. Uh, the DEA actually makes that clear in their memo that that was the most concentrated of all of the activity by the Israeli art students. They happened to be in the city where most of the hijackers were living. That's not a coincidence that cannot be written off. And we also have to examine the sort of the official line of what was going on. When I say the official line, um, I don't mean the official Israeli government line because they've actually completely, utterly denied that this ever happened. What I am referring to, though, is more like the official line coming through mainstream media and clearly what the federal government sort of massaged out as a talking point that would make all this seem like it made sense. Um, and I'll explain that later, but just basically to sum that up, the quote-unquote official line now is that these Israelis were just so concerned about these Islamic terrorists that they were tracking them here in the United States and that maybe they were even allowed to spy on them because we have an agreement, you know, between the CIA and Mossad. Um, so maybe it was all good, you know, it's all okay. Uh, but what Fox News alleges in their report is that a lot of federal agents and federal agencies thought that the Israeli government, if they were tracking these hijackers and their activities, were deliberately hiding the information from them and not passing on these warnings um, and let, basically making it so they could have stopped the 9-11 attacks. That's one of the allegations in Carl Cameron's report. However, he doesn't go as far as actually saying that. He just says that people in the federal government believe that this information was withheld from them. And there's actually a response from the Justice Department after the fallout from this news story, which obviously couldn't be kept a secret. People from the government leaked it out. And the Justice Department spokesperson essentially said that the DEA memo that leaked, which really is the most strongest piece of evidence or proof that we have that this 
was something being monitored by the federal government, that the Israeli art student operation was identified as an intelligence gathering op. The Justice Department spokesperson in the response said it was essentially written by a disgruntled, paranoid DEA agent, and there's no real evidence to back up what they're saying. But, um, you know, the, the even Colin Powell, as in the clip I just played you, and Ari Fleischer are acknowledging that there was a roundup of Israelis in the country. But I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about that towards the end. Um, so let's let's talk more about ecstasy right now. Now, there's a lot of disparate elements here that don't necessarily mean that the Israeli government controls or the Israeli intelligence controls the the worldwide ecstasy trade. I don't believe that. I'm not alleging that. But it is a fact that Israeli citizens and Israel as a hub for drug trafficking dominates the ecstasy market. That's that's a fact. That's well documented. The other parts that aren't as well known are that there have been dozens and dozens of incidents over time of actual Hasidic Jews being arrested for ecstasy trafficking. Um, there was a popular method for a while, you know, who would ever think, a, you know, someone who's dressed in traditional Orthodox Jewish clothing would ever be a drug trafficker? I guess that might have been the premise for why that w- was done so often. But you would think maybe that would be the case. Getting like a little old lady who looks totally innocent to bring in a hundred balloons of heroin in her stomach or something like that. That's actually apparently not why it was done. Apparently... A lot of the same ecstasy smuggling routes and like the organized crime that trafficked ecstasy was also involved in illegal diamond trafficking. And that's something that's also very Israeli sort of based. You know, that's well known. There, there is some crossover too with, you know, organized crime, groups of Orthodox Jews who work in the illegal diamond trade. That's also well known. This phenomenon was so prevalent um, in the late 90s and early 2000s of Orthodox Jews uh, smuggling ecstasy and being arrested for it, that there was actually a uh, quite popular indie film made about this starring Jesse Eisenberg, uh, who played um, Mark Zuckerberg in the Facebook movie. I'll play you a little clip of the trailer for Holy Rollers, um, a movie about these Orthodox Jewish rabbis getting uh, involved in the e-smuggling trade. Working for the medical business now. For a doctor? Yes, yeah, sort of. If you're looking for some extra work, it's a good job. Okay. <laughs> he loved you. He loved you. Long Spence's trip to Europe, see the world. Well, the most important thing to remember, do not open your bag for anybody because of the medicine. Relax. Mind your business and act Jewish. Is your brother a small of drugs? That's great. I knew said it. In the car. said. Give the money back, okay? Oh, we didn't know, Leon. It just happened. <sighs> Tell me the truth about the pills. They're harmless. I promise. You don't have to be so nervous. I'm not gonna rat you out to your rabbi. There's something you want to tell me. No, I really like you, Sam. I'm willing to offer you $1,500 a trip, plus I'll give you $200 for every carry you find me. Jack, he really likes you a lot. He seems like you're pure or something. Don't worry, nothing bad is going to happen. Mind your business and act Jewish. Try this on. There are rumors spreading in the community about you. There's my mishpoka. You need to keep those pills moving. We can help you do that. You did a great job. I mean, you could get us all killed. I'm sure your father's very proud. Sonny boy, see this town? I run this town. The most famous example, the guy who basically got busted dealing with the largest ecstasy operation in the United States was this guy named Cookie Ogard. Uh, His nickname was Cookie. He's an Israeli immigrant named Jacob Ogard. He was an unlikely godfather. This is actually from an article by Julian Rubinstein. I'm not sure which outlet it's from. Uh, She writes this pretty in-depth article about Cookie. I'll just start it here. Starts with, as much as 90% of the world's ecstasy supply is manufactured in secret high-tech labs scattered throughout the Netherlands, where the materials to make the hallucinogen are not as closely regulated as they are in the rest of Europe and the United States. 
For years, a cabal of Israelis have used Holland as a base for diamond smuggling through the ports of Antwerp and Rotterdam. In the mid-90s, some of them noticed that an even more lucrative trade had blossomed around them, one with few players as well positioned to cash in as they were. Israelis are everywhere, and they got to know each other very fast because of the language and the tradition, says an Israeli intelligence official familiar with his countrymen's stronghold on the world ecstasy market. It doesn't take long for a guy like Cookie to get big, he says. The article continues, Authorities say that by the time of his arrest, Cookie had brought in more ecstasy to the United States than any other individual ever has, an estimated 9 million pills with a street value of more than $270 million. What most people who knew Cookie in his early L.A. days remember is that he was a member of the Mossad, Israel's elite intelligence organization. Cookie grew up in Israel in a big Moroccan Jewish family in the north of the country and followed his ex-wife and six-year-old daughter to the United States in 1985. He spent a few years in Fort Lauderdale before moving to Los Angeles in 1989, and though he has been able to keep many of the facts about his life a mystery even to the authorities who tracked him for years, one thing is for certain. Cookie was never an intelligence agent. So this article basically alleges that Cookie has lied um, about the fact that he was an as a Mossad agent. And of course, most, I think most like mainstream journalists who've looked at the story now say that, yeah, it was a lie. Um, he was just like making up this story about himself to seem like a badass or something like that. But the story continues and I'll read, there's some quotes from it. Cookie didn't look like much, short, pudgy, hairy, tight pants, shirt unbuttoned to his navel, lime green Valentino jackets and chest nestling gold chains. So just you need a little bit of backstory here. Sorry, I, I fucked this up. Heidi Fleiss was involved with this ecstasy dealer. He basically became her enforcer. He was also involved in prostitution rings and pretty much every type of organized crime you can imagine, but primarily ecstasy. But they originally met because she ran a beeper shop, a pager store. And of course, as a drug dealer, top dog drug dealer, he would go to all these different pager stores and he recognized her. I guess that's how they for forged their relationship. This article alleges that Heidi Fleiss and one of her companions thought Cookie was a moron and he concocted the tale about him being a Mossad agent so that they would trust him and like think he was a badass, essentially. The article goes on to say, Heidi Fleiss, who has had little bad to say about Cookie, says she never believed his Mossad yarn but did make use of it. I had a lot of enemies, she says. Sometimes I needed to find out something about a girl and he'd help me. So that's one side of the story. Here's another different variation on, on you know, his potential Mossad credentials. This is from the Jewish Journal. There's a Heidi Fleiss uh, Hollywood Madam documentary by a British uh, filmmaker named Nick Broomfield. It came out in 1995. This is what Broomfield told the Jewish Journal. Ogard was Ivan Nagy's enforcer, and when he defected to Heidi after the film came out, I actually ran into him at Heidi's lingerie store in Santa Monica. He was quite charming, a little jittery. He hadn't seen the film yet, but he had seen our surveillance cameras. The rumor around town, and certainly Heidi believed it, was that Cookie had been a Mossad agent. So just stopping really quickly. So this is a you know a different variation of that where apparently Heidi Fleiss did believe he was a Mossad agent. Um, the article goes on to say, according to a U.S. customs agent familiar with the or God investigation, there was no such evidence of such an association. But or God, a.k.a. Tony Evans, a.k.a. Cookie, a.k.a. the Keebler man, had succeeded, certainly in the two years prior to his arrest and probably for several years before that, in creating an ecstasy trafficking organization of breathtaking efficacy and sophistication. Orgad's credit card statements, say customs investigators, show that he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars a month flying from homes in Los Angeles, New York, and Miami to tend to his business interests in Las Vegas, Phoenix, and Austin, and as far afield as Paris, Luxembourg, Amsterdam, and Tel Aviv, recruiting strippers, and later, lower middle-class suburban couples in their 30s and 40s 
or God outfitted them at malls, trained them as couriers, and pumped millions of ecstasy pills manufactured in the Netherlands into virtually every major city in the country, say Customs and Justice Department spokesman. So the article basically goes on to say how sophisticated or God was at removing his name from all these different operations. And in it, they don't say that, you know, this is something that someone with like intelligence experience would know how to do, but it's the article kind of bounces around a little bit about this overall idea that why are so many Israelis basically involved in the ecstasy trade? The article says, ironically, Israeli emigres were perhaps the first to achieve dominance in both markets, although one can argue as to which of these markets ultimately had the greater impact on illicit drug use in the United States. Expected to go to jury this week in L.A., an L.A. federal court is the case against Gilad Gadassi, 26, of Woodland Hills, who was arrested May 6 and charged with conspiracy to distribute more than 118,000 ecstasy tablets. And last week, police in New York arrested two Israelis, David Roish, at 28, and Israel Ashenazi, 25, for possession of 450 pounds of E, more than a million tablets packed into eight duffel bags and a suitcase. Also earlier this month, New York prosecutors secured a guilty plea from another Israeli, Sean Erez, who according to Justice Department documents had used Hasidic couriers to import more than a million tablets between late 1998 and June 1999. In May, DEA agents arrested Odad Tuito, another major trafficker ostensibly based in Los Angeles and New York. Kuki Orgad, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office, had forged ties with the New York-based trafficking group led by organized crime figure Elon Zarger. Fordham Law School professor Abraham Abramovsky, who has studied Israeli organized crime both in Israel and in the United States, told the journal that Israelis may have become aware of ecstasy use in Europe as well as in Israel long before Americans. Hence, not only were Israeli youngsters among the first to use the drug at raves, but Israeli criminals were quick to recognize an opportunity to exploit a new market and to work out the mechanics of manufacturing, smuggling, and distributing the drug. Some of this involvement may be related to the former diamond smuggling operations. Abramovsky says, Ecstasy tablets, he explains, are quite small lending themselves to the same smuggling techniques long reserved for diamonds. In addition, he says, the drug seems to move along the same routes as the diamond smuggling trade. The pills, moreover, are marketed rather ingeniously, often with designer labels or pop culture icons imprinted on them. One batch of E even had Jewish stars on them. So I could spend the rest of this podcast going over every single example of um, people associated with the Israeli government being caught trying to smuggle large quantities of ecstasy into the United States or other countries, that would take up many, many hours. Uh, there are just so many examples. I mean, you can look them up online. Google A Google search will find most of them. A lot of these articles, are since I did this research in my doc, have actually been pulled offline. So one of these days I can compile um, some more detailed show notes. I know I don't usually do that. When I do these episodes, I really should. Um, but I have, you know, way back machine versions of all these articles because I saved links to them. And just so you guys know, a lot of those clips at the beginning from that press conference talking about six Israeli nationals who were arrested um, by the NYPD for uh, one of the, or what they said is the biggest ecstasy bust ever in New York State history. Um, that was actually from the year 2000. And that was provided to me by... Um, Twitter user DJ Thermal Detonator, but just truncated version of what I could go on and on and on about. Um, there was a group of IDF soldiers busted for smuggling large quantity of ecstasy um, in the mid-2000s uh, that, that made it into news headlines. You can look that up. There was also a famous ex-Israeli parliament member who was busted for um, trying to smuggle large quantities of ecstasy as well. So those are just two famous examples um, and of course we have the biggest ecstasy dealer ever in the United States, basically the Chapo, the El Chapo of ecstasy in the United States, um, going around telling people who was a Mossad agent. 
and uh, basically having that reputation and doing things and behaving in ways and using methods that would that it were so sophisticated that it appears that he had some kind of intelligence background. But let's move on to other shit now. I mean, just to sum up this whole thing about ecstasy, because now I'm just going to move on to these other allegations about what else these art students were actually doing. What were some of these other Israeli cutout operations doing, like urban moving and even Zoom copter? Uh, You know, I mean, that one's just a mysterious what the fuck one where it's a mall kiosk that sold little miniature helicopters that was an Israeli cutout. No one really knows what the fuck those guys were up to. The question remains... Why were the art students so focused on the DEA specifically? Even though they visited other government agencies, the overwhelming majority of contact was made with the DEA in related offices, private contacts, visiting a journalist's home in Maryland, visiting an architectural firm in SF, visiting a dancesafe.org office in Oakland, California. The obvious answer would be that it's somehow a drug-related intelligence gathering operation. That's what it seems like on the surface. And if the MDMA trade is heavily linked with Israeli organized crime, which also works with the Mossad, it would make sense that these groups were gathering intelligence on what the DEA was doing. They had vested interest in protecting an industry they were benefiting from. But this almost seems too obvious and clear cut to me. So the real answer is probably much more complex and bizarre. Others like Christopher Ketchum and other journalists have suggested that this was all some kind of smokescreen to draw resources from the U.S. government to hide their more important operation, which was tracking al-Qaeda suspects and operatives inside the United States. The problem with this theory that I see is that they were mostly fucking with the DEA, some other government agencies thrown in the mix. Why wouldn't they mostly fuck with the FBI if they wanted to draw resources away you know, people who would normally be looking at terrorism-related cases. Why would they be fucking with the DEA? Why would that have any effect whatsoever on the FBI noticing or not Israelis spying on al-Qaeda suspects in the United States? How would drawing resources from the DEA keep other government agencies from noticing their other activities allegedly involving tracking al-Qaeda agents? Any way you slice this, it doesn't make sense. And I really appreciate actually what Christopher Ketchum has done on this subject, because even though he has speculated on some of these things and what they might have been doing, he has remained so agnostic on it. He's just being extremely responsible. He's laid out a lot of detail on this. Um, He's connected a lot of these disparate elements together. And he's, you know, the furthest thing away from a 9-11 truther or an anti-Semite or whatever, you know, the new smear is for anybody bringing these things up. You know, and I'll also admit, I, you know, for the most part, I had only heard of the four Israelis who were arrested on 9-11 story that were filming the the World Trade Center collapsing. And I, you know, I didn't know if that story was actually real or not. I really actually kind of stayed away from it for a while because I thought it was some kind of, you know, trap, essentially. But it turns out that it was a completely real story. A woman was so alarmed by what she was seeing from these four men who were posing as movers for a company called Urban Moving Systems, which the federal government or aspects of the federal government believed was an Israeli cutout operation celebrating the 9-11 attacks. Christopher Ketchum, you know, thinks that that part is largely a distraction from a much deeper, weirder story, the idea that they were celebrating um, because a lot of people latched onto that and you know made a big deal out of it, but the story is totally real, and it was actually only really covered on the mainstream media in a in a serious way once, um, where they actually did a whole report on it. Because even though the Carl Cameron report is really detailed and in depth, it's not specifically about this one incident. ABC's 2020 ran a report. In June 2002, about this incident. And let me play you a clip from that now. In the days after the September attacks, there were countless rumors about strange coincidences surrounding the events. One report about a group of Middle Eastern men spotted the morning of September 11th parked just across the river from New York City has not gone away. 
Investigation of their presence has led to questions about whether Israel was conducting espionage on U.S. soil. We're joined now by ABC's John Miller with an exclusive report this evening. That's right, Elizabeth. This is a case that took the FBI and the CIA more than two months to sort out, while five Israelis waited in jail. It began when this woman was watching the Twin Towers burning from her apartment in New Jersey. She noticed three men on top of a van, posing for pictures with the towers burning in the background. And I could see that they were, like, happy. You know, they, 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 were, they didn't look shocked to me. You know, they didn't look shocked. I thought it was very strange. The witness called police, who stopped the van hours later and arrested five men. All five, it turns out, were Israeli. They were turned over to the FBI. Sources tell ABC News, during a check of national security databases, some of the men were listed as having had connections with Israeli intelligence. At the FBI, that set off alarm bells. The FBI needed the answers to three important questions. Who were these men? What brought them to that parking lot on the morning of September 11th? And did they have any advanced knowledge of what was going to happen that day? The men said they were just taking pictures at the time. They said they worked for a company called Urban Moving. The FBI obtained a search warrant for the company's offices. Two SUVs were filled up with between 9 and 12 boxes and computers. Not long after the arrests, the offices of Urban Moving were simply abandoned. Almost everything was left behind. In jail, the five Israelis were repeatedly interrogated and given lie detector tests. Stephen Gordon was their American lawyer. They were asked questions if they had ever been approached by or hired by any non-United States intelligence community. While there is still some debate among American intelligence officials, many investigators believe some of the men were part of an Israeli operation aimed at monitoring radical Islamic charities that support groups like Hamas, something lawyers for the five men and the Israeli government strongly deny. These five Israelis were not involved in any intelligence operation in the United States. The story is simply false. In the end, the FBI concluded there was no evidence that any of the five men had advanced knowledge of the September 11th plot. After 71 days, the five Israelis were deported, leaving some ruffled feathers among both U.S. and Israeli officials. According to federal officials, the five men have been barred from returning to the United States for 10 years, they say because they violated immigration laws. Bottom line, John, is there any evidence any of these five men knew about the September 11th attacks before they occurred? The FBI spent a great deal of time examining this question. It does not appear that they were in place taking pictures before the planes hit, but shortly thereafter. And they say they haven't uncovered evidence that any of these five men, and they did their backgrounds, they searched apartments, they telephone records and so on, had any advanced knowledge of the attack. And while the FBI or certain sources might believe that in fact they were Israeli intelligence, they don't believe that the U.S. was a target, that they were actually investigating Muslim groups? They believe if this was an intelligence operation by Israel, that it was focused on the Islamic groups uh, and charities. As far as I'm concerned, journalist Christopher Ketchum was the one to do some of the most comprehensive work on this subject. And I don't just mean these... I, I, I'm not sure if it's four or five Israeli men who were detained as part of this urban moving company. Um, and just just so I don't come off like a complete fucking idiot... Um, I've been saying urban moving system several times during this podcast. It's just urban moving. Um, just m want to make sure I clarify that. I made a mistake earlier. But Christopher Ketchum wrote two incredibly good articles. One of them is called An Israeli Trojan Horse from September 27, 2008 for Counterpunch. It mostly details these different Israeli companies like Amdocs, like Converse, Infosys, we're basically feeding information to Israeli intelligence. And this one mostly just goes into all about how the Israeli government was using all these, you know, backdoors. It doesn't really go into Israeli organized crime. It's very detailed. Um, it's an important read. I highly recommend everybody read it. But Christopher Ketchum, the reason I bring him up now is because he's one of the only journalists to try to connect all these elements together into one overall narrative. But he too comes to the conclusion that it just ultimately doesn't really make sense and he's not sure what it was for. He wrote another incredibly detailed article called The Israeli Art Student Mystery for Salon.com 
on May 7th, 2002. He has a lot of interesting stuff in here, which I'm going to mention after I play a little interview clip with him from Democracy Now!, um, and it's just interesting how much the story has been buried where, you know, even even Democracy Now! touched it and they were sort of introing the subject as, you know, where's the follow up to the story? You know, it did get covered briefly, but then like what happened? I mean, this is like a really big deal. So here's the clip from that. It's a little on the long side. But there was no congressional oversight on another defining issue of the Bush presidency, 9-11. Questions remain over whether Israeli agents tracking the 9-11 hijackers were tracking the 9-11 hijackers before September 11th. This one we can't claim as an exclusive. ABC's 2020 uh, did this story. The Jewish newspaper, The Forward, also did it. Salon also covered the story. But where's the follow-up? Freelance journalist Christopher Ketchum has just published a comprehensive piece on this story in the newsletter Counterpunch. The article highlights various interconnected stories. The five Israeli movers who, witnessed, um, who witnesses say were cheering after the first plane struck the World Trade Center. The so-called Israeli art students who were living in concentrated areas where hijackers were living in the United States. And how two of the hijackers ended up on the watch list weeks before 9-11. Uh, Christopher, start off with a story you begin with in this latest piece, and that's the story of the five so-called movers, uh, this story that has been documented, talked about, rumored about. Explain what happened that morning of 9-11. Uh, sure. Uh, let me just preface this whole conversation just to say that the Counterpunch article does not pretend to provide readers with a definitive smoking gun for these allegations. Rather... What I've done is gathered all the available information on the matter, that is the, the, the disparate media reports that you uh, mentioned, leaked documents from FBI, CIA, and the Justice Department, conversations with former intelligence officials and current FBI officers. Now, the upshot of all this available evidence is this. The Israeli government likely was conducting some kind of spy operation on U.S. soil in the run-up to the September 11th attacks. The purpose of the operation was to identify and track Muslim extremists, possibly including members of al-Qaeda. Now, the best, uh, the best evidence that we have uh, for this is, in fact, the story of these five moving men. Now, three of these guys were um, seen on the morning of September 11th, just after the first plane hit the North Tower, uh, quote-unquote, celebrating on the New Jersey waterfront. Now, that's, that's the, I put the quotes around that because it comes from the FBI... Bolo or be on lookout, an alert that was put out regarding these men uh, that day. Um, the celebration apparently consisted of uh, high fiving, according to one FBI official, of uh, holding up cigarette lighters as if they're at a rock concert. So remember, the plane has just just hit the tower, exploded in the tower, and these these three men are behaving rather oddly. Um, Later in the day, they were picked up. Two other men had apparently joined them in a van. They were, um, they were, the case was immediately handed over to FBI counterintelligence. Uh, the men were held for 71 days. Um, they were repeatedly interrogated. They were, uh, well, they, they failed, repeatedly failed lie detector tests. And, um, and then after those 71 days was up, they were sent home, apparently under pressure, or because of pressure brought by the Israeli government and by um, certain players in the U.S. government, uh, and the story sort of disappeared from there. I mean, 2020 Just covered thing, this. Chris Ketchum, you say, um, you quote the officer who arrested them, and, uh, named DiCarlo. You say, according to DiCarlo's report, this officer was told without question by the driver of the moving, of the moving van, Sivan Kurzberg, we are Israeli. We are not your problem. Your problems are our problems. The Palestinians are the problem. Right. Well, what's interesting there is that, you I mean, you recall uh, after the first plane hit, um, no one really thought that this was a terrorist attack. I mean, most people thought, and I was there, you know, on the Brooklyn waterfront watching this whole thing. And I, everyone thought it was an accident. Uh, these guys, when they were interrogated by FBI, told them that, uh, essentially said that they immediately knew it was a terrorist attack. And uh, they actually told FBI that the reason they were celebrating uh, 
uh, was because uh, the uh, the attacks would be beneficial to Israel, that it was a, quote, a good thing for Israel. That's according to the FBI spokesman who spoke on the record about this. And, um, and that it would bring uh, sympathy for the Isra- Israel's political uh, agenda in the Middle East. Um, and if I can interrupt, I'd like to bring in Mark Perlman to the conversation. Mark, it was your newspaper that, uh, the forward that first broke the story, that the FBI thought that at least a couple of these people were Mossad uh, agents. Could you talk about that and, and, and how you uh, uncovered that information? Um, yes, we, we ended up writing a story in March of 2002 after several uh, months of reporting because when this uh, incident happened, uh, obviously a lot of people were intrigued, in, including journalists, and uh, so everybody was trying to, to find more information about this. And uh, uh, I've been uh, talking to sources and trying to find out a little bit more. And after a while, I was able to confirm that, uh, according to the FBI, two of those movers uh, were identified as Mossad agents. And, uh, and they, they were interrogated about it. Obviously, the, the circumstances around the interrogation, there was a lot of panic after 9-11. People were looking for suspects everywhere. So the reports about exactly how they were behaving and what they said, uh, it, I mean, we should be a little bit careful about this. Uh, right. because, uh, and so what I tried to do is go beyond the report reports about them uh, smiling and high-fiving and so on because I had my doubts about this. I still have them, by the way. Uh, and so what I did was try to, to back up the information I had that they were indeed recognized as uh, Mossad agents who were essentially tracking uh, a Muslim activist in the New York, New Jersey area, which was known to 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 be uh, active uh, in this since the mid 90s, and uh, and so that we eventually were able to piece the story together and 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 go with it. And what eventually happened to the to the five men? They were uh, they were uh, sent home to Israel uh, in I think November, if I remember, um, uh, allegedly for uh, immigration violations. Um, and, uh, and their home. We don't have much time, and I wanted to get to another story, which was a story of the so-called art students, Christopher Ketchum. Very briefly outline this parallel story. Uh, well, basically, the, the, uh, the, f- the phenomenon of the art students, for want of a better phrase, because it is truly a, a mystery, even, you know, even to me. I'm a complete agnostic about this part of the story. The these so-called art students were young Israeli men and women who were traveling the country. They were identified by the, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency as uh, repeatedly attempting to uh, penetrate government offices, including DEA offices, and to, to sell, to try to sell uh, art, these cheap knockoff oil paintings, to uh, government officials. Now, um, after September 11th, uh, when, you know, in, in the wake of, well, in the wake of the, these sudden attacks, uh, investigators began to go back and look at the, uh, the, the nexus of art student activity with uh, the nexuses of the activities of the, al- the, the future hijackers, or the 9-11 hijackers. And um, what they found was that the art students, in many cases, were living in very close proximity to the September 11 hijackers. Many of these art students were moving large amounts of cash. Some of them were uh, were, were reportedly, according to Le Monde, uh, carrying uh, uh, cell phones provided them by the vice consul, an Israeli vice consul in the U.S. Um, they were uh, many of them were trained, uh, highly trained in, in electronic intercept and intelligence work that was far beyond the compulsory uh, military training required by Israeli law. Uh, so these were je- these are part of the uh, the suspicions. Suspicions were aroused, and they and they remain. So. Suspicions that they were tracking uh, the hijackers. That's correct. Uh, let's go to Alexander Coburn. Uh, you have published this piece. Uh, it is titled um, Cheering Movers and Art Student Spies. What did Israel know in advance of the 9-11 attacks? Who were the Israelis living next to Mohammed Atta? What was in the van on the New Jersey shore? How did two hijackers land on watch list weeks before 9-11? Who shut down Fox News' Carl Cameron? Um, <clears throat> we just have two minutes. but. Talk about the way the media has covered this, why you chose to cover it, and that last story of Fox. 
The main thing, Amy, is that uh, basically this story, which uh, Perlman and others did, did do good work on, has been systematically um, suppressed by the media for a very long time, starting with Fox News, which killed off Cameron, the ABC News, which dropped it, and obviously there are thousands of questions which Ketchum goes into in great detail, which should be the subject of congressional hearings and investigations, such as was the Mossad essentially being subcontracted by the CIA to work in the United States on spying, which would be illegal, how much did the Israelis really know? If it was a good thing for Israel, maybe they withheld the final news that the thing was going to land. That's a speculation, of course, but it should be investigated and probed. It's absolutely extraordinary that Ketchum's story, which has been worked on, which is a very long and complex story, could not find any outlet until a counterpunch, which is what we're here for, could publish it. It's, uh, the, obviously, the main reason is the word Israel. People drop it like a hot potato. As soon as you hear people saying it's a good thing for Israel, you get, the whole uh, lobby came in and had those people whipped out of the jail and sent back to Israel. And since then, all questions regarding it had been systematically choked off. I think that's the sort of, you know, journalistic powder cake. So Alexander, it's, it's, this uh, story that you've published um, first was going to go to Salon.com, then The Nation. Uh, that's what I understand from Christopher. Yes, that's true. Christopher Ketchum. Uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't, the editors didn't feel that um, there was any news here. So that's interesting that not even Salon would publish that story. Even though there is a story currently still on Salon, like I was saying, called The Israeli Art Student Mystery from 2002, written by Christopher Ketchum. So I'm going to basically wind the podcast down now with just some extra facts to just you know, throw out there to see if, you know, anyone could follow this information up and explore it themselves. There's so much more out here. I mean, I'm just looking at my notes. I didn't talk about maybe two thirds of what I have in here. Most of it's just, you know, the same type of info that I've already talked about, just different cases, um, different incidents. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that this story just sort of disappeared. And for the last two and a half years, three years, we've had this manufactured story about Russia penetrating every aspect of American life to dic you know to sway our politics here that's that's ninety nine point nine percent fucking bullshit that's just been dominating the news cycle and yet this story just totally disappeared. Dateline covered it, Fox News covered it, Democracy Now covered it, Counterpunch covered it, a few other little outlets covered it, and it's gone shit's gone. So there's actually another federal memo that got leaked um, from the Office of the National Counterintelligence Executive, ONCIX. Um, it's from the archives. The website's actually inaccessible right now, but someone duplicated it. And the memo is titled, Suspicious Visitors to Federal Facilities. And it goes into the Israeli art students thing. So this memo actually came out before the DEA memo, but it's very, very short. It's only maybe three or four paragraphs long, vaguely warning about what these Israeli art students act like and look like. Some other interesting facts. There's a thing called the Shea Memorandum. Um, it was detailed and uh, written up by Gerald Shea, the district attorney for San Luis Obispo County of California. And it was submitted to the United States Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence to investigate this spy ring specifically. Um, and the memo is actually really interesting, really detailed. I recommend everybody read it. Um, it's it's called, technically the whole name of it is called The Memorandum to the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks Upon the United States, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And it's a PDF. It's about 166 pages long, but it's worth the read. So people should check that out. That has a lot of interesting facts that tie all of this together, similar to the Christopher Ketchum article's. There are also other official mentions of the Israeli art student ring by federal officials that have leaked one of them. I can't find another source for them, but there are emails back and forth between people, I believe, at the DEA and Justice Department, according to Wayne Madsen in a book that he wrote called name of it, The Star and the Sword. Wayne Madsen, you know, he's done, definitely done some problematic things. Um, I cannot vouch for the validity of the book, but he does have leaked emails in it going back and forth. And I'll read to you just one of them saying, 
you know, this is like sort of concern over this story leaking to the media. And uh, um, uh, someone named Heidi Raffanello um, messages someone named Dale M. Zisit about Converse, Infosys, which uh, the Fox News special talked about. And uh, she says, as you may have heard, security program is briefing the administrator tomorrow morning on the Israeli student's investigation to include T2S2 Converse and JSI. This was a result of the Fox Network expose on Israeli counterintelligence activities. It remains unclear if Converse personnel are security cleared. And if so, who are they? And what type of clearances are on record? If you have names, I can run their status in personnel security. <laughs> wow, that's nuts. It is one little tidbit I wanted to leave you with from the Christopher Ketchum article, The Mystery of the Israeli Art Students. On May 19, 2001, he reports that two Israeli nationals, quote, requested permission to visit a museum, unquote, at Volkfield Air National Guard Base in Camp Douglas, Wisconsin. Quote, approximately 10 minutes after being allowed on the base, the two were seen on an active runway taking photographs, unquote. The men, charged with misdemeanor trespass, were identified as 26-year-old Gal Cantor and 22-year-old Svi Waterman and were released after paying a $210 fine. According to the Air Force security officer on duty, both were asked if they were involved in the selling of art while in the U.S. Cantor became very upset over this and questioned why they were being asked about that. Cantor's whole demeanor changed, and then he became uncooperative. So that's very just bizarre. It's almost like some of these art students were acting like, I guess, what the Bush administration was warning the public about of how Al-Qaeda might act like, taking pictures of like federal buildings and going to like military bases and taking pictures of them to case them for terrorist attacks. Very odd. I'm going to leave you listeners with that. And thank you so much for listening to this podcast tonight. Probably going to do some kind of follow-up podcast about this in the future. If you liked what you heard on this podcast, please consider donating to us at patreon.com slash media roots radio for as little as $1 a month or $1 per episode.